Okay, so we uh, we talked about the settler capitalisms and dynamics, and uh, that was a uh, reason why I was very keen to emphasize uh, that earlier and, and before the Japanese context is because to a, to a fundamental degree, the, uh, the key lessons from settler capitalisms start and end with the story of the United States. And of course, that was, we were really foregrounding that because we were, we were speaking so much about the rise of the mass um, enterprise. And what's striking in the, uh, the US case, of course, is the, uh, the sheer scale of the settlement uh, to the point where the population now of the United States um, and the size of its market in particular has uh, obviously eclipsed Europe from which so many migrants came because the United States benefits from being kind of probably the uh, preferred on average investment destination for people from all over the world. Uh, then of course you've got Canada, Australia, New Zealand and uh, um, some uh, other places include uh, old Europe, uh, which to my mind is in no way a pejorative or a negative kind of thing but uh, we tend less to think of them as uh, European countries as migrant destinations. So we'll skip through this stuff you've already seen and talk briefly about rentier capitalisms. Now rentier capitalisms, uh, it comes from this notion of extracting a rent, okay? A, a rent is a return to, a, to some kind, to, to any asset, okay? Um, from an it's a, a revenue that you can earn from an exploitable asset. Now it can be an intangible asset, asset in the sense of a company with a very strong position in a market and it's able to extract um, prices over and above what would prevail in a fully free market because of, for example, tariff protection and whatnot. So that's why we, we, we refer to rent seeking. But of course, you know, pay the rent, yachin in that sense as well. So that's a return to a, uh, to a fixed asset, real estate. Uh, we understand that. And uh, we often speak about uh, rents accruing to natural resources. There are things that um, by uh, good fortune or divine will or whatever, you, whatever your take on it is, that um, this means that uh, there are resources that can be exploited. And then that raises fundamental issues of who actually owns uh, those resources. Now, let me just uh, look into chat because I'm seeing a bunch of individual messages. Okay, oh, that's fine, that's good. Just a couple of people in um, direct message me. Um, that's absolutely fine. Okay, uh, right here. So revenue from natural resources. So the main focus here is actually on natural resources, Shigen, and uh, whether natural resources are a benefit or a net cost. Now, historically, of course, to have natural resources was considered to be a, uh, an intrinsically wonderful thing. And that's a major reason why countries went to war. We still see most of the stories justifying um, border disputes, for example, as presented in terms of resources, um, natural resources, resources belonging to the nation and uh, to be legitimately uh, developed uh, under the auspices or direction of national authorities. So the private companies would typically be involved in doing that. So then the question is how much do they contribute? So, you know, if we look at the uh, Senkaku, Daoyu kind of rivalry, the, you know, the issue of claims and the um, um, territorial dispute between uh, People's Republic of China and Japan, uh, a lot of the discussion is really about things like fishing rights and whatnot. Uh, and, potentially under now currently utilized, but promising future natural resources. You know, there might be oil under the sea and a whole range of things. The vast majority of economists um, are of the view that many of these, most of these disputes just don't make sense from an economic point of view. That the uh, enormous costs involved in routinely scrambling um, extremely expensive airplanes uh, they were somewhat $100 million each um, to enforce understandings of national territory and uh, routinely deploying um, maritime forces and whatnot. They, they, they are hugely expensive resource commitments um, that, are, that are born right here and now and weighed against um, any expected return to natural resources discounted by the, by the various risk factors and they're huge. 
um, whether it's the resources don't deliver as much as they uh, are imagined or unexpected costs of developing them in the first place and whatnot, generally those territorial disputes don't actually um, add up to making sense. Um, historically, some of the issues in territorial disputes have not been the natural resources per se, but the ability to either to, to trade natural resources, access to ports, for example. Russia was long obsessed about having an ice free port, and um, hence uh, a lot of its forceful positioning um, in the Black Sea, for example, and the, uh, the issue with Ukraine, for example, in Sebastopol, uh, which is a major. Um, Russian naval military base and was a major battle in World War II have as much to do with uh, controlling trade and not, not just about getting your, your navy out, um, but literally being able to trade resources. Uh, I'll spend a bit of time talking about the Russian case, um, less about uh, the Middle East, although I'll touch on a bit, um, there's a huge range of interesting issues there. Uh, this is a nice visual, um, even, over, even though the visual itself is a little bit um, messy in terms of the particular topic, uh, the, the particular copy of it, and um, even messy uh, still shared over Zoom. Um, but simply put, for those of you who've got a really, really bad um, internet connection, um, I'll decode the numbers for you here. Uh, the green bits are petroleum, so gasoline, okay, petroleum revenue. Um, the blue bits are mining, and it's got mi mining and petroleum revenue put together. Um, now, that may confuse people. Um, but uh, what effectively this is, is it's a way of just kind of coding each country based on their natural resource mix. So where you see countries that have got green, um, overwhelmingly their revenues are from petroleum, which includes gas, okay? So it's um, oil and natural gas because they're typically naturally occurring together. Um, complicated kind of ways, often much more gas than, than oil, um, sometimes uh, both. OK, um, mining of petroleum where it's blue, these countries have both. So they have natural gas, oil, um, but they have also some other um, significant things to mine. In the case of Bolivia, for example, it's a major supplier of lithium, which is absolutely fundamental, obviously, to treat um, manic depression and uh, as a drug. And it's in every lithium ion battery and is absolutely critical to the development of things like electric vehicles and whatnot. Um, so when you see red, that's mining without oil or natural gas, okay? Uh, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of particularly striking examples there. Mongolia, for example, uh, very significant uranium deposits um, and uh, other minerals deposits. Um, and what you can see on the left hand side uh, is the top number, of course, is 100. So if you're right up there above 90%, uh, okay, uh, this is total revenues from abroad. So national, um, well, national and, and foreign derived revenues, okay. Um, so what we're looking here is um, and why I say the national is because you know there is some domestic consumption of this, so that's included in that. So that's what we're, we're talking about: total earnings from a particular sector. Okay, so it's not as a, a percentage of GDP in total. That's that's not the case. It's, um, total um, export earnings and earnings from industries uh, domestically, but not 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 some GDP. Quite. Okay, so Saudi Arabia, um, we see over ninety percent. Okay. Um, Brunei, both of these fundamentally dependent on the oil price. Now that's okay for Saudi Arabia because it's the world's cheapest producer by far, okay? So it uh, is a, to a very substantial degree a price maker. Uh, and there's always this issue of the relationship of the Saudis to other members of OPEC, the oil uh, producing uh, consortium. And uh, then we see a number of other countries uh, that we recognize um, from the Middle East, of course, that also have very significant dependence on um, oil and natural gas revenues. So we see you know, Oman, Libya, Kuwait, Bahrain, for example, uh, the UAE. Uh, many of you would know that these are, these are of course, very um, affluent places in terms of urban cities and those who are citizens um, and very large um, expat communities. Um, I should say, sorry, um, in the case of um, the, the, 
Libya, Libya, Libya is a much more complicated story and of course went into a, into a ter terrible civil war and whatnot. Um, some countries generally have very low per capita incomes, nonetheless have very significant natural resource sectors, such as places like Angola, which had very bad civil war, probably of the Congo, um, Nigeria, um, East Timor, uh, Timor-Leste with Australia, got independence from um, Indonesia, um, and it's their primary uh, resource. Um, and Algeria, Iran, um, Iran, a very complicated case, subject to um, US-led sanctions and uh, very complex issues with the uh, um, deal that's been done for Iran to suspend its um, nuclear development program. Well, effectively, it was building, looking to build a nuclear bomb and uh, negotiated agreement, uh, which the Trump administration thought that the agreement didn't go far enough and reimposed sanctions on Iran. And, and then lots of businesses are caught in an awkward position that if they, uh, they breach sanctions on Iran, uh, then they can get themselves in huge trouble in uh, the United States. And that's exactly what's happened to the, uh, the daughter of the founder of um, Huawei, a uh, Chinese company, major telecommunications company. Um, she's currently under house arrest in um, Canada. Um, the issues there are actually not about trade between China and the US per se, but actually a business involved is um, violating um, economic sanctions against Iran and a couple of other places. That's the, the particular issue. So. What happens when um, oil prices turn negative? It obviously can be devastating for countries where their principal source of national revenue um, is actually from uh, oil, natural gas, for example. And not just negative in terms of uh, declining prices from existing kind of market highs, but actually literally go negative. No one ever thought it was possible for oil to go negative. But earlier this year, it did. The oil price actually went negative. You actually had to pay people to take oil from you. Okay. Um, and the reason is that um, there's no way to store it. With people staying home, with not using their cars, with so much industry shut down, um, oil consumption absolutely slumped. Uh, most countries have only a limited strategic reserve um, for national security reasons and whatnot. And that all completely filled up. And one of the most valuable things you can own today is an oil tanker, okay? Um, an oil tanker is not actually used for shipping oil to, from one place to another in order to offload it so that people can use the oil. Uh, literally, they're just being used as floating storage tanks, okay? And so ran out of all of that capacity. Uh, the other problem with oil, the oil industry and oil extraction is it's effectively it's pump <laughs> and you're pumping it from underground and um, high pressure and you've got momentum in doing that to actually uh, stop an oil pumping operation is a technically very difficult thing and very expensive thing. Uh, so to, to literally uh, stop the pumping uh, to they use mothball, but a bizarre kind of, you know, kind of metaphor um, in that sense. Uh, to stay the business temporarily and then restart it is hugely expensive. So even if you give the product away, it's better to keep the flow flowing, okay? Um, it's like cows. You can't just decide to not milk your cows today. Um, and uh, my uh, great uncle, my uh, grandfather's younger brother, um, I remember when he was a kid, uh, used to, when I was a kid, used to tell me about the, uh, the worst thing about the dairy was that you always had to be up every single morning to milk the cows. Um, and a similar kind of thing, if you actually own oil rigs, um, you have to keep distributing the oil, otherwise you have um, huge technical problems. You cannot just let it splat all over the ground everywhere or into the ocean or whatever. So the perils of being a petrostate. Okay, this is from the Wall Street Journal, um, that effectively, uh, if the oil price collapses, you're in a really, really bad place, okay? And this has very negative implications on your economy uh, directly. It has implications on your currency. Foreign earnings are declining significantly. And uh, as a consequence, all other imports become dramatically more expensive, okay? Uh, so we see in the Russian case, this is uh, an earlier set of data when there was oil, oil disruption. So we see very uh, dramatic decline in the value of the Russian ruble to the point where the uh, Apple store in Moscow, for example, stopped taking payments in rubles, that they were only quoting the price of Apple goods in US dollars because Apple had this policy of adjusting um, 
every couple of months its prices, which actually means that if, uh, if you're from a country where your currency declines rapidly, get you to an Apple store very quickly uh, because Apple is a bit slow to adjust its prices. And this does happen. In fact, um, when the Turkish lira, lira a few years ago declined dramatically, there were a whole bunch of people in the days where people could fly, jumping on um, cheap uh, tickets to get themselves to Istanbul to buy a heap of Apple products and take them back and then um, resell them in other parts of Europe, for example. So literally arbitraging the price differences. So then, of course, we see um, significant declines in the economy uh, as a whole, as, as we've seen in the, the Russian case. Um, very important thing in a Russian case was, uh, and this is the, uh, the potential curse of having natural resources, okay? Um, it can be very corrosive of the political process that uh, effectively you can enrich yourself if you can have good political connections which give you the right to uh, extract natural resources that are very much in demand. But of course, even if you've got the right to do that, there are a whole lot of technical issues uh, and of course there are very significant financial issues. So you need to have the backing of people who know how to do this, okay? Um, this often means that uh, major foreign companies that have uh, expertise in the resources trade, financing resources projects and whatnot, um, they themselves are in strong demand from people who are looking to do some deals and get rich quick. So particularly Japanese shosha trading companies, they have to be extraordinarily careful about the projects and the people they end up getting involved in, involved with. Um, particularly with the Americans being very sensitive, for example, to economic sanctions. So we see that um, Japanese trading companies were, um, some of them were rather too enthusiastic about the prospects of a return to Iran when the uh, nuclear deal was done with Iran under the Obama administration and they saw significant opportunities um, in effectively uh, rebooting uh, uh, Iranian oil exports. Then of course Trump was elected and uh, that made the Japanese trading company's position uh, rather more difficult. We've seen some Japanese trading companies in the past in Russia get themselves in trouble in terms of being accused of bribery and whatnot. Um, normally that comes about simply because they backed the wrong horse, you know, in terms of some, uh, the, po the politics of who gets the right to develop projects, okay? And in a place like Russia, without political connections, nothing gets done. Uh, that's just a simple truth. Also a very significant transition um, from the Soviet system. Um, we saw that some people got uh, very rich very quickly. There's uh, an excellent film, which is in Russian and French, uh, which actually focuses on some real life um, Russian billionaires. Um, it's called A New, the, a New Russian. Um, you may you may be able to find it on a streaming service or something like that. So it's a kind of a no holds barred account of uh, the re the realities of um, how people who were very very uh, quick to move at the end of the Soviet Union and get control of what were once state owned enterprises uh, and got them very very cheaply because of the uh, the privatization mechanism that was used. And we'll touch on this in a later course uh, uh, in turn later class in the course about control events and um, how state controlled assets on behalf of the people turned into private assets with sale processes and whatnot. So there was, uh, there are a lot of issues there. Um, it kind of helped that if, uh, that if you already were a bit expert in things like intimidation, um, intrigue, espionage. Uh, so we do see some people who used to work for the KGB, for example, um, having a, a distinctive expertise uh, that was in demand um, in the transition to a, a kind of a, a capitalist regime in Russia. Uh, although if you read The Economist, for example, and the, uh, the authors of her textbook were very much associated with The Economist, very often um, Russia is referred as kind of klepto-capitalism or a kleptocracy. That's, uh, kleptocracy uh, is a, uh, a political it's 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 the rule of thieves, okay? Dorobono dorobo seiken, okay? Kleptocracy. Um, that's a, maybe a little bit unfair to Russia as a whole, uh, but there's a point about. Okay, uh, Russia is very much heavily dependent on oil and gas resorts as we uh, exports, as we can see here, the resources making vulner, significant vulnerabilities there to um, price falls. 
Um, at the same time, key Russian uh, exporters have had such large market share because they've sold very large volumes of cheap gas to a number of Western European countries. And so they've become quite dependent on Russian gas. One of the biggest issues for the European Union in relation to Russia is this issue of gas supply. Gas pipelines, which come through uh, the former Comintern countries, from through Eastern Europe, uh, that come to Western Europe, um, it's far and away the cheapest source of cheapest source of energy for uh, Europe as a whole. And we can see some number here, numbers here in terms of dependence on Russian gas. We're going into winter, of course. Um, Russia's uh, Russia's gas is absolutely uh, critical for everything from house warming, you know, uh, to fueling power stations and whatnot. So the Czech Republic, Poland, Slovakia, Slovakia 100% dependent, for example, on Russian gas, um, Hungary and whatnot. Um, there are really complex issues about where pipelines go because, of course, you, you, the Ukraine here is a major pathway for Russian gas through you. And um, even when there was a very clear military conflict between Russia and uh, Ukraine, um, with obviously pro proxy fighters who were, uh, they were Russian and Russian backed, but um, proclaiming it to be entirely um, intra-Ukrainian civil war kind of conflict, we still saw significantly the Ukraine was both dependent on, on Russian gas um, and pipelines that were carrying gas from Russia through to Western Europe were, were still in operation. Of course, Ukraine, um, if it hadn't been using the gas itself, it would have been very tempted to simply um, turn off the Russian pipelines uh, and have a bargaining chip with Russia, but it itself was so so dependent on the gas. Uh, the building of pipelines is a never ending issue, political issue, economic issue, Japanese companies with expertise and actually this project management building them are always in discussion about this. Um, this blue, it's kind of chopped off over here, um, but there is a um, endless discussion about um, a pipeline to get uh, gas uh, across to Japan. Um, and to feed the uh, Japanese economy uh, through that. And some trading companies such as Mitsubishi and whatnot have been uh, long involved in um, those deliberations. And uh, there are other very significant sources of, of gas. We can see here Kazakhstan produces some. Azerbaijan is a major gas producer. And if you, uh, that's rather difficult to look at yourselves, so download the slides um, here, have a look at the, uh, the slides. Um, also within the Mediterranean, one of the most interesting developments is um, just off the coast of Israel, they found very large supplies of natural gas um, between Cyprus and Israel, but most of it actually in Israel's um, exclusive economic zone. This is really quite transformative, not just for Israel, but for political developments in the um, Mediterranean, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, Golda Meir, former Prime Minister of Israel, once joked that, um, that it was a Jewish gag that um, Moses had led the Jews wandering in the desert for 40 years and finally led them to the promised land and the promised land of the, the state of, you know, where Israel is, you know, to Israel, Eretz Israel, um, led them to the promised land only to discover that it's the only place in the Middle East without oil, uh, which is uh, quite, quite a sobering notion. And uh, there is an interesting correlation nonetheless between having oil and having political instability um, and well, at very least having non-democratic regimes. And that's something we'll come back to in a moment. But we see the, uh, maybe Moses knew something that for decades, the geologists didn't know that actually off the coast of Israel were very large natural gas reserves under the sea. Um, lots of promise to export that natural gas to European markets and the Europeans would like it because they would love to reduce their dependence on um, the Russians. Uh, the Europeans have constantly been arguing with Israel over uh, things like West Bank settlements and whatnot um, and the uh, peace process or the lack of a peace process for the Palestinians. Um, at the same time, Israel is considered to be extraordinarily dynamic in terms of scientific research and whatnot. So the EU involves Israel in its um, things like what we call Horizon, it was Horizon 2020, and then the new round of them. Um, so major scientific collaboration and whatnot. So it's provoked a lot of discussions. Uh, one of the really complicated issues is to try and get Israeli gas to uh, European markets, 
the most attractive um, thing to do cost-wise would be to put it through pipelines. Pipelines are actually very cheap. Even, even putting pipelines under the sea, it sounds like a really, well, it is a very expensive thing to do, but it's still um, relatively cheap as a distribution strategy. Um, but there is this huge issue of Cyprus and Turkey um, and Cyprus is a, uh, da, 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 this is this island down over, da, da, over here, um, Eastern Mediterranean. The, the one on this very bad map here on the right that looks like a, um, looks like a guitar, okay? Um, or a guitar case anyway. So Cyprus is divided between Turkey and Greece. It had um, long standing Turkish and Greek populations that lived together in relative harmony. Um, but then a Greek nationalist movement kind of took hold uh, and there was a push to, with, it was effectively ruled by Britain and as Britain was pulling out, they've still got an air base there. Um, there was a strong push to try and unify Cyprus with Greece, which is up here. Okay, this is Greece. Uh, the Turkish population were resistant to that. They wanted an independent Cyprus. Um, there was a coup d'etat. Uh, and then the Turkish army invaded um, into the predominantly uh, Turkish population area in the late 1970s, 77, I think, 74, 77, don't hold me to it, Google it if you want. Um, and uh, ever since Cyprus has been divided. So Israeli natural gas um, would have to go through Cyprus waters or alternatively, there's already pipelines that are connecting um, Turkey. So you could actually uh, ideally, if Turkish-Israeli relations were good, and they, they have been good historically, but not, not recently under the, uh, the current Turkish president, uh, you could put a pipeline directly to Turkey and you could plug into Turkish pipelines um, and sell the gas to the Turks, or the Turkey, Turks could then connect up um, and sell, on sell the gas to other parts of Europe. So complicated issues. Uh, the workaround solution in that case is something that Korea stands to profit from. And think, what, Korea? Okay, uh, we have very sophisticated technologies now of gas liquefaction. It takes an enormous amount of energy and a massively expensive plant operation. Normally it costs about a billion dollars to build an onshore plant. Um, and you gotta get the gas from the sea typically, that's typically under the sea, um, well, under the ground, under the sea. Uh, you have to get the gas to the processing plant, you apply enormous amounts of energy, and effectively you turn gas into a liquid, an extraordinarily explosive liquid. Um, then you put them in very large ships, and you can see pictures of these ships on the internet. They are like, they have huge balls, like floating balls on them. Well, um, different, not all of them do, some of them do, um, different, different forms of them. And so this LNG trade, the liquid natural gas, so, so it's liquefied natural gas. Um, and then you transport the, uh, the gas by ship. Um, by the way, if uh, a terrorist attack ever hit one of those ships when it was in port, it would be extraordinarily devastating. There was some modelling done of if an LNG um, um, container ship uh, blew up in Boston Harbour, how much of the city would it destroy? Um, and the model suggested the larger part of Boston would be destroyed. Um, it would be the equivalent of a, of a nuclear bomb going off. Um, and to get some sense of you know what explosions can do, if you've seen the uh, the, the footage of the uh, the terrible tragedy of the explosion in Beirut and Lebanon recently, so anyway, the Korean angle is um, some very smart engineers have figured out how to build floating liquid natural gas platforms. Okay, so these very fancy plants that will turn natural gas into a shippable liquid, um, and it's a floating platform. And why is that so significant? The problem is with any natural resource development, when you have to spend a billion dollars to build some processing equipment and it's stuck on the land, the people who invest in it are then very much beholden to hold up by governments. Okay, you come along, you spend a billion dollars, you build your LNG processing plant, and then the government turns around and says, hmm, you need electricity. We're going to sell you we, uh, the electricity and we've decided that it's going to be twice as expensive as you thought. Okay. Um, or you need an export permit or whatever. So it's what we refer to as, and I'll put it in the title, you can end up with what's called a stranded asset. It's used in a lot of term, in a lot of different ways. It's some kind of asset that has the feature of what economists call asset specificity. It can only be used for one purpose, um, and even worse when it's tied to a particular place. So this leads to what we call sovereign risk. And we're going to talk about this when we talk about foreign investment. Um, 
that the government turns on you because you can't take your asset away. There is a very expensive power station built by American investors in India that, that has never been turned on because the, uh, the state um, kind of reneged on an understanding about how much it would pay for the electricity that came from the power station. The, uh, the state politicians there thought, well, they built it, now they have to turn it on. And the huge American company involved refused to turn it on. So it's a kind of a legendary uh, case. Uh, the largely Korean built liquid natural gas floating platforms have the advantage that they can be moved from one place to another, not without expense, but it overcomes this hold up problem. And so that's a significant technological response to political risk. Anyway, the resource curse. In short, um, uh, as we touched on, it's just simply, is that the danger that natural resources lead to your political system being corrupted? Uh, because people get focused on making money from natural resources. Um, hence the notion that it, that it is a curse. And statistically, it came through very clearly, sorry, that should be not eat Asia, um, although all the food is wonderful in Asia, East Asia, okay. Clearly, uh, resource poor countries outperform resource rich countries, we understand that. And as a consequence, um, this led to widespread recognition from the 1960s that the real foundations of economic growth um, really lie in good organization, good human resource development and whatnot. Natural resources can be a bonus, but without those fundamental issues of good governance, the theme of the course, then natural resources are uh, not much of a help and may even be a curse um, for the very simple reason that they uh, distract people from higher value added activities. And in particular, they draw people into the politics of rent seeking and corruption and whatnot. But some societies have managed to overcome this. And Norway is a spectacular example. Norway was relatively the poorest area in Scandinavia for a very long time. It had wood and it had fish, <laughs> relatively small population, um, very much local governing. It only got independence in 1907 um, from Sweden. The Swedes didn't realize at the time that they had um, some astonishing um, share of the world's oil and natural gas off the, off the coast. I, I doubt that the Swedes would ever have let the Norwegian be independent if they noticed that. Okay, so Norway has managed to use its natural resource endowments um, for the national good. And just one quick anecdote on this. Um, Norway provides scholarships for uh, its citizens to study abroad, not completely free, you don't have to partly pay them back, um, but they help to subsidize uh, study abroad and this idea that um, all Norwegian citizens should invest in education um, and particularly being a small country and remote country, you know, to engage with the world at large. When I worked um, at uh, Australian University and uh, in the Faculty of Business and School of International Business at Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, um, we had the sudden blondification of the campus. Uh, what happened was that uh, our university international office managed to get our university programs in the business faculty certified by the Education Ministry of the Government of Norway as a place where Norwegian students could study with a Norwegian government scholarship. And so we went from one year where I think we had one Norwegian student um, with Australian connections to Norwegian students becoming one of our largest student cohorts. And so we suddenly had this kind of um, very funky hipster Norwegian um, army of international students all arriving because of course many people suddenly thought mm, the government will pay us to study abroad. Uh, they did a uh, quick search and found what I can go all the way to Australia. Um, the place is uh, top temperature uh, in the middle of the day is never below 20 degrees, um, which half the time is uh, midwinter is actually warmer than midsummer is in Norway. And I can go there with a the government scholarship. Yep. Okay. Right. That'll do me. And so it lots of people turn up. I do remember once being on um, open day orientation and these very funky dudes kind of turned up and said, uh, Hey man, where can I park my car? And I said, oh, that's going to be hard because the center, central city campus and all the faculty members were complaining. And I said, oh, I was a bit brave coming from the campus we, we, by car. And they're like, oh, we just arrived. And I said, where'd you arrive from? And they said, Perth. They had just driven right across Australia and had managed to arrive just in time for the international student orientation event. Um, they didn't had, still hadn't found out where they were going to live. Um, and they had all this stuff in a camper van. And um, I thought, okay, this is, 
this is just relaxed, easygoing kind of Norwegian approach to, as the Japanese would say, nantokanaru. But I think Japanese only say nantokanaru when they know that and you can't actually do anything. It's a way of making you feel better about something that's not going to work, whereas Norwegians tend a little bit more optimism. And that optimism kind of comes about from, and we'll talk about this next week, um, a social system that actually kind of backstops or underpins you. You know, if you get ill, you're going to get looked after. Um, and the state has the means to do that. And in the Norwegian case, the natural resources have helped. So one of the big things, of course, is uh, who actually benefits from the natural resources. Now, when governments are kind of organized and they do extract revenues, then, of course, the government gets very dependent on it itself. And the government often makes lots of promises to population in the short term, um, particularly transitioning to democracy. And uh, if suddenly the oil revenues drop away, it's very difficult to meet those promises. It can be made worse by demographic trends. And so I'm kind of throwing in here as an aside demographic uh, developments um, in relation to dependency. So they're actually separate issues from natural resources, but I want to kind of um, slip it in here as, as a pretext. And that's why I was particularly keen to speak to, uh, to this today. Um, so you can get arguably lazy, even just relying on demographic expansion. And I think that's something we really need to keep in mind that economic growth was actually relatively easy for a lot of countries with growing populations and their institutions and whatnot were very often predicated on, hey, this works, we've got a booming effective economy, but they had this natural um, growth dividend of, of, of a large and enlarging population. So it kind of makes development relatively easy. Uh, and how does it make it easy? Well, markets are growing, demand is growing. Uh, if you're thinking about opening a, uh, a store, you're thinking, well, it's a growing population. Okay. Um, invest in shopping malls. Um, there's going to be more shoppers. Okay. That makes a whole lot of sense. This is where for those settler societies, um, COVID-19 is so dramatic, and I'll use the Australian example because it is one of the most dramatic. Um, Australia's population change this year is negative since the first time, and the first time since 1916. And why 1916? Well, Australia was involved in World War I, sent large numbers of soldiers to fight um, for the British Empire, and migrants couldn't come. So there was a net population reduction. This is the first time that the Australian population has shrunk despite large numbers of expats returning, although lots of expats can't return. Uh, there's a waiting list to actually, actually get back because only 5,000 people a week can come back because everyone has to do two weeks quarantine. That also means no international students can return. Um, the only comfort is you know, that equally citizens are excluded. There's just no prospect of me going back to Australia for months uh, to come. And uh, in the Australian case, people have uh, got very much accustomed to the optimistic notion that you have this virtual cycle of a growing population and investment, okay? And we, we saw all these statistics are very clear. And I spoke to exactly these issues way back in the opening of the course, um, that this subset of settler economies that were able to do very well through positive uh, inflows and a virtuous cycle of um, population growth, migration, capital flows, economic growth, attracting more migrants, attracting more capital from overseas, okay? So COVID-19 has disrupted that um, in the short term. But also uh, there is another dependency ratio aspect here too. Um, we often think of it just in terms of the population, of the, the working population supporting uh, the non-working population, that's the way to think of it. Um, but also of course, um, there are two dimensions to this. There's the elderly who may be self-funding and actually less of a burden than we imagine if they have uh, all the government on their behalf has planned for their retirement. So income, um, future income planning and whatnot. Um, and then a the dependency ratio of children. In a short term, kids are a bit of a burden, okay, um, for the individual parents, but you actually spend a fair bit of money um, involved with kids. So people, if people have kids, they spend money in education, housing, all of those kinds of things. Um, so they tend to not save very much and consume a larger proportion. Kids are expensive. And if you um, want to look at some numbers on this, you can Google it. People have worked out, you know, just how, how much kind of one kid costs kind of nonsense money, you know, re edu educating until the end of university, for example. Um, and what we see, of course, is significant periods of economic growth when you had um, this dividend of kids um, as a short-term stimulus to consumption 
and uh, then entering the labor market and earning themselves. So you get this supply side kind of growth, okay? And um, you could look at this period here where there has been a um, demographic dividend and there are various ways to plot this here. And I've just got this um, chart that shows. Um, why is this significant? Well, when you get a dip in the dependency ratio, what it means is that there are ultimately more people working and fewer few people supporting, supporting them. Now, it's a temporary thing if they're kids, because the kids will grow up and work. Um, if it's an aging population, this is, becomes more and more of a problem, okay? So even in the Australian case, which is uh, one of the most striking stories of using immigration as a driver of growth, remember Australia adds more than 1% its, uh, to its population a year through net migration, okay? Um, to put that in perspective, you think about it, you know, Japan's population, what is 128 million? If Japan was to do what my country, Australia does, it would take 13 million, 13 or imin, every year it would take 13 million, um, I don't know, what am I saying? Sorry, I can't do mass. 1.3 million, come on, come on. 1.3 million, uh, no, so, 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 yeah, okay. I can't speak English anymore. Can't, can't do maths in English anymore. Okay, so it would be taking um, 1.3 million migrants a year to Japan to get the same demographic effect that we see in the Australian case. And by the way, California has a similar dynamic to Australia. If you treat California as the Republic of California, as all the Californians would like to think of it, okay? Uh, maybe with New, New, New York as a, a kind of, a, as the Tasmania of, of California, maybe it's a, it's a nice place to go to for, uh, for a fun weekend. So when you get a sense of the demographics, this is where it gets very sobering. To put this in perspective, in the Israeli case, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, people claiming Jewish heritage, over a million people moved from the former Soviet Union to Israel at a time when the Israeli population was under 8 million, okay? So the sheer transformative nature of migration, this is not something that people have a feel for in Japan other than the, no, that's not something Japan does, okay? And of course, age dependency ratios, um, it's, really, really striking in two ways. Poorer countries often have um, a lower age dependency ratio. People have more kids when they're poorer, interestingly, uh, because the opportunity costs of having kids are being out of the labor market are actually lower and kids are seen as a resource, for example, until, until they are uh, diminishing returns. Um, but you know, if you send your kids off to work or something like that or put them to work on the farm, um, then it can make sense. Of course, longer term, there is a growth dividend from population control. But if you overdo it, you can strangle the long term economic prospects. And this is why China, for example, has dropped its one child policy and actually put incentives in place to have more than one child. But what's interesting is that the population uh, have not embrace that people as a whole not really embrace that um, you tend to have you know the these little princesses and princesses phenomena you know where you've got uh, four grandparents funding um, one kid um, so yeah they do well um, some of them become sport brats of course um, because grandparents tend to uh, have all the joys of grandchildren without the responsibilities of looking after them the old age dependency ratio, it's not a problem if societies are investing in long-term um, income support for elderly populations. So if people are saving for their own retirements, it's fine. Now, if the government's going to do that, the government has to actually um, have high tax rates. And we've seen that in some places like Scandinavia, people agree to pay high tax taxes. In return, the government has very little debt. It probably properly funds old age pensions and properly funds medical systems. And there's a lot of mutual trust in the system. When on the other hand, the taxes don't keep up with the age dependency ratio, um, you're going to have a problem. And so we look in the Italian case, um, we see relatively Italy is quite an um, old population. There are various reasons why the birth rate was so low in Italy. One of the fascinating things in Europe is Catholic societies that are typically associated in the past with having huge families, to be blunt, the Catholic Church used to oppose contraception, um, actually have some of the lowest birth rates. And one of the reasons for this is because they uh, have lower, lower rates of household formation, 
that is people marry later. Uh, my Italian female friends all joke that, um, well, Italian men look lovely. Um, they really don't want to spend their time ironing the guy's shirts and underpants and uh, all the rest of it like his mother, beloved mother does, okay? So uh, as a consequence, um, many more Italian women invest in higher education, have pro um, professional jobs, and if you look at, say, the feminization of fields such as even engineering, but particularly um, medicine, for example, in Italy, it's striking. So this is one reason why Corona hit so hard in Northern Italy. And by the way, Bergamo, which was a real center, was a, I happened to have been there a year and a half ago, an absolutely gorgeous place, um, and, and in Milan and whatnot. Um, there is an image though, that the Italian medical system wasn't very good. That's wrong. The Italian medical system is actually excellent. Um, very high quality doctors. And indeed, uh, the British medical system probably would break if it wasn't for the fact that you have large numbers of Italian doctors who've gone to work in, in, uh, in Britain. Uh, the real problem in the Italian case was actually that it's um, generally the Italian state has run up a huge amount of debt uh, in keeping the system going kind of well. So that the, the real reason for the, the tragedy of the first wave of corona in the Italian case is more that actually Italian families are very, very close to their elderly. Um, you know, grandkids see their grandparents every, every couple of days or every day or two, or maybe they even live together. And uh, there are a whole bunch of very particular factors with, that led to the tragedy of those kind of clusters there. Um, but other places as well have strikingly aging populations, Greece, Germany, Sweden, Portugal, Finland, France, for example, Denmark, all of them. Um, it's just simply that uh, without huge migration, although migration is an issue, um, but more significantly with uh, the career attainments of women, uh, women are marrying later. On average, if you marry later, you have fewer children. You have one for the experience and that'll do. Um, and as a consequence, the age dependency ratio increases. Now, I think we all know the most extreme in the world is actually Japan, okay, with Korea catching up fast. Um, so Japan, more than most, has this potential crisis of an aging population. Uh, as I said, way in the begin, way off in the beginning of the course, um, it's not that actually the Japanese medical system is particularly inefficient. Actually, it's quite good in keeping costs under control. The government suppresses costs by regulating them. Um, it's just simply the uh, the rate of aging population, and so the demographic outlook is is quite intimidating. Okay, um, Japan is this uh, beige color here, uh, which has far and away the most uh, worrying uh, trend, but coming close coming close, very significantly, often overlooked, is China. Um, China is down here as the dotted beige line. By the way, in the, uh, the Korean case, remember the statistics that we, sh we saw, we shouldn't forget that um, it was only one and a half, two generations ago um, that the average number of kids for a Korean family were six, or births per, life births per, per mother person was nearly six. Um, which has dropped below two below one. Okay, um, so this sets up Korea for a really long term set of demographic um, pressures. Okay, now I just really want to briefly speak to um, Japanese context, just to um, add a little bit of color to what was mentioned in the book. You know, the book tended to focus largely on the, the distinctive features of Japanese firms and the Kedetsu, the Zaibatsu and the Kedetsu structure, which is very, very interesting. Um, so I just want to add a little bit uh, to that in terms of the broader governance setting and finance. Excuse me. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that everyone works through these, these slides independently anyway um as you should and uh, but nonetheless um, it's useful for me to speak to them uh historically bank financing was very significant although there have been periods where the japanese stock market was significant as well um so i'm really speaking primarily in the post-war period here equity financing was significantly underdeveloped relative to bank financing and historically intra-group financing there's a lot of financing that came from within um, Keiretsu, a lot of the equity stakes uh, from group companies and former Zaibatsu holding stakes in each other. But really significantly, we have to remember that the um, bank financing, we have this feature of what was called the main bank. So every large industrial group, Zaibatsu historically and Keiretsu after World War II, had a bank at its center, okay? 
So in a sense, these are very sophisticated and the textbook talks about this. Industrial conglomerates with specialized, specialized functionality in particular firms. So we had the Sogol Shosha who would do all the international trading aspects um, for the large industrial group. You would have this core kind of mega bank um, at the center of the Zaibatsu later of the Kedetsu. Um, and then you would have distinct, uh, distinct um, financing functions around that. You would have an insurance, ins separate insurance um, provider, for example. And then um, very often because of regulation, Japanese regulation, you'd have things like credit, uh, personal credit, um, credit card businesses and whatnot that might be offer offered separately. So a lot of the boundaries of the firms mirror certain regulatory restrictions historically. You remove some of those restrictions and uh, you see kind of restructuring of assets. Um, I'll jump to a key conclusion and to simply say that one of the really striking things through the 1990s post bubble is the rationalization of many industries across all Keiretsu lines. So banks like um, Mitsui Sumitomo, Sumitomo Mitsui, um, and that's not because I don't know the name, it's because um, it's both. One, it's, it's so Chuta Hampa, but it's, Japan invented Chuta Hampa, right? And no wonder Japan has a, Japanese has a great word for it. Japan does Chuta Hampa like nobody. Sumitomo Mitsui, Mitsui Sumitomo, okay? Um, it's the same bank, okay? Um, both of them were core banks in separate Keiretsu, and we get a cross Keiretsu kind of merger. They're both um, pride, got lots of pride, and um, both of them wanted to have their name first. So the compromise to say they had was, well, then English, which is very koksei techy, very global, and you're going to look really cool. You can have your name first. Um, and um, although we've got more customers domestically, when we write it in kanji, we'll have our name first, okay? Um, so I don't know, they should have called it the squid bank or something, I don't know, given them a completely, f and that's not entirely ridiculous, uh, there's a tomato bank uh, created to freshen up a, um, uh, a regional bank in uh, Tomato no Mesanchi, uh, no Tokoro, so in Tomato Ginko, and they even gave free tomatoes to people who opened an account, uh, so it's not as dumb as it sounds to call it the squid bank or something. Anyway, strikingly, you had these Keiretsu groups. Historically, um, shares were rarely traded in large volume. Um, there were individual investors who would trade them and some independent investment funds and whatnot, but a large proportion of the shares were kind of passively held by group company, group uh, groups within the Keiretsu grouping. This made um, hostile takeovers uh, near impossible. The historical Zaibatsu kind of became uh, the, these looser confederations of Keiretsu um, when the Allied occupation scap abolished the holding companies, um, which have only recently been allowed to uh, exist again. I've just talked about the main bank thing. Uh, I've covered this already. Um, there were some rules, regulations, particularly after World War II, which limited how much banks could have a direct stake in their own borrowers. And there, there are a whole bunch of principal aid reasons, incentive reasons for that. The legal limit was up to 5%. So it was, it was possible for a bank to take shares in uh, one of their customers, um, and uh, that's kind of like a bond posting kind of dynamic, a mutual kind of commitment between the bank and the uh, company. Very often this was temporary if a firm got itself into some troubles and needed some loans. So in, in a sense, the banks become a quasi-investor, uh, portfolio investor to some degree. Um, for the most part, the main bank doesn't interfere in management day to day. But if a company gets itself into trouble, um, the main bank um, takes the lead role. Now, uh, there are several reasons why lots of companies, and remember, the, the actually the majority of Japanese companies, um, as many smaller and medium-sized enterprises, haven't belonged in one of the key. It's a grouping. But they had a main bank-like relationship. They had a key bank that they dealt with. And this is actually the, um, tied to the, uh, the basic incorporation function that you actually have to identify a bank um, that is that holds the account, the key operating account or foundational account um, at, the, at the point of incorporation. And um, this is tied to the whole Hunkle thing, which is being discussed, you know, the seal. So the actual corporate seal um, would be uh, registered with the bank, okay? And uh, that entrenched the, and the paid, there was a minimum paid up capital, which you know, had to be held in reserve. So that entrenched this notion that there was this core bank that you went to. 
Another thing with banks is that they play a key role in syndication. That if you need a very large amount of money and you go to the bank, the bank is not going to use all their own money. They will be the, uh, the lead lender, but they will put a portfolio of other lenders together to diversify the, uh, the risk because they don't want all of your, um, your risk, risk on their books. Uh, they need to effectively hedge as well. So what, the one thing I really wanted to emphasize here um, to really just complement um, what was in the textbook there is to briefly mention um, the status of labor in Japan, okay? Um, and these, these famous three pillars, uh, lifetime employment is a very striking one, but it's not really lifetime employment. You know, the really sobering thing for me is no, I'm 53. Um, now, the, it's changing, but for a lot of Japanese companies, although, you know, it's this idea you work for one company for life, actually, the, a lot of people, even they got to around my age or early retirement, 55 or whatever, um, they, that was the kind of the retirement age. And then companies would then find a kind of a second life for people. They would send them to the supply companies, Stalkin, Kibio, Toka, and they would send them as a, uh, as a senior manager or a board member or something like that. And that kind of underpinned relationships. Well, that's been significantly breaking down. And in return, what's been happening is that um, lots of employees uh, the retirement age has been lifted, for example, to still 60, but that's quite low. Um, I, I quite often have students come to me saying that with Yugaku, they're in a quite difficult position because their dad didn't get their, uh, the um, second position that, you know, he hit retirement age. Um, and I, 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 be, I became a dad quite young uh, and later again. Um, but there are, there are plenty of plenty of students in SILs whose parents are kind of confronting this prospect of sort of, sort of, you know, kind of like sulky taishoku, which you really don't have any kind of choice in. And then what are we going to do um, afterwards? So it is nowhere near lifetime employment. That's the first thing we, uh, we really have to emphasize. By the way, Waseda is very attractive for people to work at because the retirement age for professors at Waseda is 70. Most universities, it's 65 private universities. KO at 65, for example. Um, so you get an extra five years of working life here. Although with Soki Taishoku Sedo, um, economically, it's better to quit at 69 from Waseda um, because you can get a special bonus if you quit early. And it turns out if you work until 70, you spend the whole year working for one of my colleagues, kept it, I think you get two sun man or something, is the difference um, by working the extra year. But there are people who do it. Um, it's, it's really quite interesting. Okay. Now, in, importantly, lifetime employment, seniority based wages, Ninko Jordan, really fully developed after World War II. So it's not entirely a, uh, a cultural thing, but there are historical reasons um, why it became so widespread. One of the fundamental reasons with the seniority based wages is in mass production, really difficult to tell who's actually more productive because. This is the problem with, with fact, factory line work. The factory production only works as fast as the slowest point. So you know who is the least productive. You know, it stops again, everyone goes, oh, Mata Tanaka ka, oh. oh no, and everyone like throws their hands up. Someone go and tell him and, you know, help him, help him fix it, get the line started, okay. And everyone's like, do, 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 wait, 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 okay. Well, we get it together, classic hold up problem of, of continuous production. Okay, so we know who the, we know who the problems are, um, um, but except in certain things such as sales, we uh, it's very difficult to identify who the who the outperformers are. So a simple thing to do is to pay everyone the same, but recognizing that as people have more experience, of course they they want to get paid more, and also life stages. You know, as you get older, you get married, you have kids, you suddenly start having to pay money to send the kids to university and all those kind of things. Um, and so Ninko Joritsu was something that actually unions strongly advocated for, seniority-based wages. Um, the notion of the kigyo betsu kumiye, enterprise-based um, unionism, this was a pragmatic thing. This largely grew out of some wartime patriotic associations that existed. And immediately after World War II, suddenly Japan is liberalized and the trade unionists can, can they get let out of prison. Uh, the lefties, the communists, they released. Okay, they've been arrested by the Kimpei Tai and whatnot. They're suddenly out and about to activate. So it's only natural they went into companies and went to existing organizational structures. And the World War II government had created these kind of labor associations very deliberately to 
engage workers in war effort and to head off any organizing by left wingers. Now, of course, lifetime employment and whatnot, it has some cultural resonance, you know, this notion of a loyalty to the master. And, you know, if you if you want to run a culturalist account, you can, you know, we, we talk about the 47 samurai and, uh, you know, um, getting, uh, you know, being being loyal to your your master unfairly dealt with and all the rest of it, blah, blah, blah. You know, so in so in that sense, this this it turns um, cultural stories into a legitimating kind of virtue. But most of these key features of Japanese labor market practice, we can understand is predominantly a post-war phenomena. And it's really important to think in those terms, because if this is not an ancient continuity thing, if it's not that, you know, people who once upon a time, they worked for their Han and they were loyal to the daimyo and all the rest of it. Um, and that those values just simply got carried over to company man, as the textbook uh, in this last chapter talks about, um, then that would suggest that work life is not going to change so much, that there is this cultural continuity. In fact, what's happened is that we're constantly reinterpreting. We use the past to justify current practices. Um, and just a couple of things to really emphasize why there, there's a little bit of kind of cultural faking of some of this. There was a lot of strikes after World War II. There was a lot of militancy. Um, communists were very active, for example. There were over 250 takeover strikes, Toshiba, a whole bunch of companies. The workers took over the factories, particularly because SCAP, they came in. They were, they were abolishing the holding companies and the controlling families. And so it was going to be, who's going to control these companies? Well, effectively what happened is you end up with this white collar uh, managerial class, you know, the graduates of the likes of Waseda and Keio who um, had gone to work for these enterprises, suddenly found themselves in this situation of what the text refers to in relation to the American case of kind of, um, you know, ownership without control there were these all of these cross shareholdings in group companies and the holding companies were abolished and so these shares that were in the holding companies were then vested in the companies themselves and cross shareholdings so these kind of groups of companies own each other and you get this professional managerial class who are not owners of the company but they work for the company okay and so this is this is this kind of accidental phenomena of the salary man led um uh capitalism distinctive in japan hence you know some economists joke that you know um japan is the only place where communism has kind of worked but many on the left would disagree because they say no it's this kind of elite core salaryman kind of communism okay rather than a really inclusive worker-owned model and so many on the left are actually advocating to uh for japan to go communist for these companies to be made collectives and to be run by the workers. Um, you then see a really big pushback from managerial elites, lots of Wasser graduates and whatnot, you know, calling in strike breakers, dealing, getting, the, getting the Yakuza to come and beat up um, um, trade union leaders and whatnot. So one way to actually win workers over to cooperating with management was to promise lifetime employment. We're not gonna sack you, okay? Um, work patiently. And once some trust took hold that management was really committed to this, it also meant that younger workers were prepared to forego short term income in return for high levels of training so that they could skid up um, and know that they were secure in being able to work for that company for a long period of time. And um, Already large companies had been, amongst the Zaibatsu had been cooperating not to steal each other's workers and that had been reinforced during World War II. And so those kind of no poaching agreements kind of held after World War II. That's why you just never see someone being headhunted um, from Nissan to Toyota, for example. It just, just doesn't happen. Um, when actually Carlos Ghosn came in and actually he um, poached uh, their design director from Isuzu, uh, brought him to Nissan, uh, uh, Nakamura Shiro, a brilliant guy, wonderful guy, he used to come regularly and give lectures here in Sills for the Nissan corporate case study I ran. I mean, that shocked the industry that you actually took uh, one of the, uh, the really talented people from a rival company and made him chief creative officer, put him in charge of design in your own firm. Now, the really important thing here is we're really talking about a quasi uh, meritocracy, you know, that these core employees, say shown, they become a privileged constituency within Japanese companies. 
Very significantly, many Kumiai, even today, Hijokin and Haken, of course, um, and Keiakushain cannot join the union. So the union becomes a strong backer of the Seishain. And there's a real hierarchy of employees in these organizations. So it's not true that people don't get fired in downturns. The Japanese companies have long used of shock absorbers, temporary workers, women, and particularly Ippanshain, mostly women. Um, and they provide a degree of flexibility with the kotobuki taishoku uh, kind of thing. Get married, um, you know, join, work, for, go to, the old model was maybe your mother's generation for some of you. Uh, no, go to junior college, um, become a OL, uh, no, Ippan Shoku, um, meet your dad maybe at uh, Shokubade, um, fall in love, get married, quit at 26, have a kid, uh, okay? Um, and so the company had a lot of turnover. So this was how they were able to reduce costs. Where I first remember uh, when, when I came to Japan in 1990, straight out of university, worked for a bit and worked for a couple of years based in uh, Nagoya and traveled to a whole bunch of companies. I was doing Shanai, Shanai Kyoiku, so I routinely went to Toyota's Honsha. Um, I remember everyone was telling me about this Christmas cake phenomenon. No one wants to be Christmas cake uh, no, left over after the 25th. Okay. Well, that only makes sense in Japan because people eat like sponge cakes with strawberries, which if you leave it more than a day, you're going to poison yourself. But actually a good English fruitcake, you know, the, you can eat that two years after Christmas if you want to. Now, now of course, you know, this, there's been absolute kind of transformation of the culture. Um, but up until the bubble, those values still very much uh, were prevalent. So uh, you had these core employees who tend not to move from companies. There was much less headhunting. I mean, so many of these things are now kind of breaking down. At the same time, you had a rather weak market for corporate control because you weren't having takeovers. So labor to some degree had influence over, over management as well. And so you, you, face, you see fairly significant and generous pay rises being given to the uh, core employees. So if you don't have activist managers, um, effectively, if you've got uh, activist owners, if you don't have um, uh, outsiders coming in, um, if effectively the firm is captured by elite management stream, then why don't the companies end up really, really badly run? Because economists would suggest so. Well, there are a bunch of reasons why the adverse selection and moral hazard problems get attenuated. And so I haven't really spoken too much about adverse selection and moral hazard. I'll put some links online to these concepts. Um, those of you who take introduction business already know, but I made some videos about this last semester. So I'll link to them so people can watch those videos. Mm -hmm. Several reasons. Um, in some areas, uh, the government was rationing capital. And so if you wanted to get licenses for foreign technology or large borrowings earlier on, this is particularly in the 1950s, you had to be one of the more efficient, more productive companies. The really big thing is intense competition in the domestic market. And we saw the statistics here very, very clear with Japan. Um, Japan is, has been and still is overwhelmingly domestic. Okay, exports as a percentage of GDP are very small, rel relatively small, a bit bigger than the US, um, but significantly smaller than major European economies and uh, South Korea, for example. So effectively domestic competition, you know, nine Japanese car manufacturers competing with each other, for example. Um, and then of course, because you've got these main bank relationships and these cross shareholdings and these institutions of the uh, Kaicho Club, and, you know, where the, uh, the, the Shacho and the Kaicho, the president, you know, the presidents and the chairman, typical chairman rather than chairwomen, unfortunately, of Keiretsu group companies would deal with each other. You know, they could say, oh, 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 aren't that you know, that they, they uh, could kind of pressure a group member company very informally um, saying that, look, you know, the opposition's catching up on you, you know, uh, don't expect us to bail you out if you get in trouble. And they actually did sometimes, but uh, they, would, they would pressure them there. So also because of their exposure, holding, holding stakes and their expertise, they could informally help. Another key factor, we want to tell ourselves this at Waseda, I hope it's true, meritocratic education and recruitment systems. The, you know, if the top universities were picking the brightest students, and then the uh, companies were picking the brightest people from the brightest university student cohorts, then they should have good quality um, employees. Um, 
We hope that's the case, let's, let's say it is, okay? Uh, the other big thing, of course, is internal promotion. You know, there is competition. Uh, there, are more and, there are more and less desirable jobs, so people have incentives to perform internally. But there's some basic problems. Companies become rather growth rather than profitability oriented. And particularly when you had lots of, lots of people hired, um, it was kind of like a pyramid. But as uh, after the war, but then as uh, effectively the economy matured, you get this aging of them, the baby boomers. They all want to be cacho and bucho, for example. Okay, so you need more cut and boo. Okay, so there is this kind of growth orientation to um, literally accommodate a demographic pressure within the company. <coughs> Excuse me, that a swigger. I wanted to last the last five minutes when I get there. Also, hoarding of capital rather than returning it to shareholders because the shareholders weren't demanding it. And we'll talk further about activist shareholders trying to do that later on. Um, lots of investing in assets such as land and things like that. The age changing, age, changing age wage profile I've just mentioned. And one of the biggest problems, myopia. Um, if everyone enjoys a shinsotsu and they've only worked in one company um, all their working lives, it becomes very internally oriented. While the economy stays stable, while industry structures are stable and familiar, that's kind of okay. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, there is some observing of what your competitors are doing. There's a lot of industry associations, there's a lot of conversations, but you don't see the disruption coming from unexpected places. Uh, you know, Japanese um, manufacturers have just been absolutely whacked by the, uh, the Apple effect, for example. You know, huge disruption in terms of product categories, a whole approach to doing business, for example. Um, if you had asked any Japanese electronic um, firm manager uh, 30 years ago, would it be possible um, that the world's most valuable company would be a seller of both products and services um, in the consumer electronics space, and they don't make any of their own products? They would have laughed at you. It would be completely unthinkable. But that is what Apple does. Apple uh, sells products and services, and it does not make its own products. It now it has its own chip that it's moved into, um, but that's because it has so much cash lying around and thought it might as well do so. Um, but it became um, absolutely dominant through outsourcing, um, not having control of its own plants, for example. Another key thing in a Japanese case is because of the large domestic market and domestic growth dynamics, Japan was able to do pretty well without foreign direct investment. This is extremely unusual. Um, Japan stands out as far and away um, having the kind of lowest percentage of foreign direct investment um, of all major um, OECD economies. Historically, public policy was quite nationalistic, quite restrictive. Those restrictions were removed, but by then the scale of the Japanese market and whatnot and the challenges of the operating environment, it was a difficult place for foreign firms um, to get a foothold. Some sec sensitive sectors are still limited, but that is the case for most places. Um, if we have a look at uh, statistics, there is this funny thing statistically where Japan actually kind of goes backwards a little bit here, just to ignore that, that funny glitch there. Um, this is just a visualization of the FDI as uh, stock as a percentage of GDP, okay? Um, Canada, its proximity to the United States, uh, and particularly after NAFTA, we see so many American firms just choose to cross the border to Canada, um, very striking. France has a bit of an image of being um, close to foreign investment, but actually it's not. Um, it is strikingly high. Although there is some interesting distortion, thing, distorting elements. There are some French companies that turn themselves into Swiss companies for tax reasons, um, but uh, predominantly are French in character. So if we look at an economy such as Australia's, uh, we see huge dependent on foreign, dependence on foreign investment, whether it's in manufacturing historically um, or whether it's in natural resources. Um, but the USA too, uh, foreign firms play a huge role in the US economy, okay? Um, so this is one of the, uh, the sets of issues for Japan, even when inbound FDI increases, it's still off a very low base, okay? Um, and one of the interesting things we're seeing here, uh, 
an increase in as in uh, relation to GDP. Okay, so this is a total kind of a stock number and in proportion to formal GDP. So it was picking up for a while. It's going to be interesting to see what COVID does. Um, okay, so that's that covered there. Now um, I'm just going to show you, but I'm going to hold it over because I don't really want to rush you. I just um, I've got just a couple of minutes. I want to cover just a couple of slides because they're historical slides and then leave the vast bulk of the conversation about all the new ecologies to um, next week. Um, and I just want to cover the old uh, and this shopping list of issues that some of these things that you want you to keep in mind for um, this last uh, more than well, where, where are we now? Um, about last remaining third, 40% of the course. Okay. Um, in terms of varieties of capitalism, um, a lot of national, even regional variance is a very significant um, story. We're not going to see utter convergence between societies. We've got unique mixtures of laws, institutions, histories, cultures. That's a key thing. But what is um, inescapable throughout time and place over many centuries are mechanisms for trust. And one of the things I want to emphasize is that actually much of the new economy, new capitalism, um, although we tend to focus on the digital, that actually many of the drivers of the development of new businesses out of places like Silicon Valley and whatnot, um, strong elements of creativity, actually have managed to figure out high levels of trust in a similar kind of way to what we've seen in much earlier forms of business. When trust is lacking, the economy is less likely to grow. So strong laws, fair courts and enforcement, and sometimes it can be informal enforcement mechanisms can work. Anything that generates networks of trust, this is a key theme. And in that final written component of the course, this is something I really want you to be able to demonstrate that you understand. Um, that the mechanisms for building trust um, have varied throughout time, but it's trust is the key theme. And I want to emphasize the role of Chinese entrepreneurs in Southeast Asia. Um, minorities, um, migrants, but over centuries, and the outsized influence they have in their economy. Um, but these networks, so it's, it's networks and it's trust, and it's the two things, okay? The networks that bring information that allow people to do business across place, okay, across countries, for example. Um, this is a very old statistic, but it still gets a sense of it. Um, back in, way back in 1992, um, although ethnic Chinese in Thailand were only 10% um, of the population, like 80 something percent of share capital of companies was effectively Chinese controlled. Um, Indonesia, even more so, relatively small population, three and a half percent of um, Chinese Indonesian having an outsized stake in the economy as a whole. But even strikingly in the Philippines, which we tend to think less of. So that introduces some potential political tensions but I really want to focus on the positive aspect of these Chinese networks of trust. And they're now reaching to, um, um, obviously, to some degree back into China, but less than people imagine. Um, they reach very much into California, to Vancouver, to Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, okay, uh, a whole bunch of settler societies that are very significant. Now, of course, we have a fragile social uh, consensus in some respects, but the critical thing is this is a relationship-based business, um, sometimes even referred to by economic historians as RBD, okay? Um, so relationship-based business, personal networks become very significant. Malaysia provides a very interesting case study because you've got good governance, the formal legal system and institutions, there was a British colonial legacy, okay? Um, and so many Malaysians have, you know, gone to study accounting or law in the UK or Australia or whatever, and they can walk straight back into uh, Kuala Lumpur and uh, practice law or accounting because the qualifications are recognized. At the same time, you've got this predominance of Chinese in business and the founding families closely control, control their businesses. Sorry, lunchtime, I put really, I mean, Malaysian food. Malay is some of my very favorite food, okay? Um, this is where I want to pick up from next time with these involving, evolving models of capitalism. And I just want to finish with one line and I'm conscious I'm one minute over. Uh, the chapter you've just had to read in the textbook really emphasized uh, the power of organization. Um, 
that uh, people like Sloan, who was a manager, he wasn't, he wasn't an entrepreneur, he wasn't a capitalist, he was a manager, he started as a young, young engineer and he rose to the top to head this enormous entity that was GM. He really brought about a revolution in managerialism and so many other organizations captured it. The creation of business schools everywhere mirrored this, you know, the idea that you could be bright and have no money um, learn some key skills and go and be a manager was absolutely critical. And it really focused on organizational structures. And it allowed businesses to grow bigger and bigger and bigger and to see it in terms of organization. But we'll see that there are lots of downsides to this bureaucratism or yakshoson mindset, silos, and daiki tuka, all of these kinds of problems. So, so much of the dynamism that we've seen in the last couple of decades, the unbundling of the company, the rise of the startup, Silicon Valley, so many of these phenomena, this adaptive efficiency we'll talk about from next week, are because competent professionals are in fluid networks of trust. And if you want to see where it all starts, it starts with Hollywood. And uh, I'll start the conversation next week with taking, speaking about this. A couple of people on Zemi, we talked about this yesterday, the unbundling of the integrated Hollywood studio that was built like GM was. You know, okay, Hollywood studios used to look like GM. Um, now they're very fluid networks of creatives. And when we talk about Scandinavia in particular, we'll see that this is why Scandinavia and countries have an even higher rate of startups and um, entrepreneurship than we see even in the United States. But of course, you know, if you get up close to the United States, you see in California and Silicon Valley and whatnot, a similar kind of thing. And if you want to look for um, parallels, um, actually to look to more traditional communities of entrepreneurship, whether it was Jewish traders, financiers, or overseas Chinese businessmen and women in Southeast Asia, give us some real hints about micro level economic dynamism. So if you kind of take the combination of organizational capabilities, high levels of education and good networks, you get a lot of economic dynamism. 